Uh, hello, and uh, welcome to Creating Affordable Housing, Ask the Experts. I'm Alex Bagnall, a member of Envision Arlington, who, along with the Housing Corporation of Arlington, the Housing Plan Implementation Committee, and the Town of Arlington are hosting this evening's event. Moderating our panel will be Abby Curve, uh, who is on the board of the Housing Corporation of Arlington, and Karen Kelleher of the Housing Plan Implementation Committee. This evening, we will hear from representatives of four different developers sharing how they are developing and preserving affordable housing in our, the general Boston area. After they have presented their case studies, Abby and Karen are moderated discussion between the panelists, followed by an open Q&A period. A bit of Zoom housekeeping, uh, we ask that all of you keep your audio muted until you are called upon in the Q&A. Uh, we will be using the raised hands feature to select questioners. Uh, some background on uh, why we wanted to have this discussion. Arlington is an economically diverse town. Uh, more than one in four households are low income and one in 10 are extremely low income. As housing costs rise faster than incomes, that economic diversity is being threatened. High housing costs burden residents and create financial insecurity and a risk of displacement. This is especially true for our senior population. 5.7% uh, of Arlington's housing stock is considered affordable, and we'll have further discussions about different levels of affordability. Uh, we are quite short of the state goal of 10% affordable housing, and uh, to meet that goal, we would have to add 850 new affordable housing units. This might seem like a large number, but spread out over a 10-year time horizon, that's just 85 units a year. Um, and not only is that a state goal, but many would argue a, a moral goal that, that we should have that, not merely as a way to uh, address 40B. How could we get there? We have a number of tools, um, including the Arlington Housing Authority, our inclusionary zoning bylaw, CPA and CDBG funds, the Housing Corporation of Arlington, the newly created Affordable Housing Trust Fund, the possibility of a real estate transfer fee, the recent passage of our accessory dwelling unit, and our Fair Housing Action Plan, which includes a number of steps that we as a town can take to eliminate housing discrimination and segregation. Federal ARPA funds can also play a role and will. So quickly looking at our current stock of affordable housing units, you can get a sense for how they were created. The vast majority of our existing affordable inventory is with the Arlington Housing Authority and dates from before 1983. Today's panel seeks to explore how today's affordable housing developers put together projects and what we as a town might change to encourage affordable, de affordable developments in town. With that, I'll turn it over to Abby and Karen. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much, Alex. Abby, you wanna take the lead here? Sure, hi everyone, uh, this is Abby Kurve. Uh, and I'm primarily a resident of Arlington, so I'm really excited to host this forum. Uh, I'm, in, in, I'm excited to introduce our speakers for the evening who will help us unravel the mystery surrounding affordable housing development and the funding and everything that goes into it. Uh, we will go from some very local experts to those working on a national level. Uh, with that, I wanna you know, get straight to it straight into it. Our first speaker is from Arlington too. He is the principal architect from Narrowgate Architecture based in Boston, uh, specializing in design of affordable community-based architecture. He's also a long-term board member of Housing Corporation of Arlington, HCA, uh, our local nonprofit CDC, and uh, is, he's here to present on uh, the Downing Square Broadway Initiative. Please welcome Neil Mongold. Thank you, Abby. Um, Yes, uh, I would just like to say a few words about the Housing Corporation of Arlington for those who may or may not be familiar with the Housing Corporation. We are a nonprofit um, organization in Arlington founded in 1987. Uh, we are different from, we are not the same entity as the Housing Authority. The Housing Authority is a, is a public uh, authority. The Housing Corporation is a private nonprofit corporation with uh, a board of volunteer directors. And the Housing, Housing Corporation of Arlington um, it also owns, as you saw in the previous graphic, we own 102 units of affordable housing spread throughout Arlington. 
we uh, own and manage 102 units of rental housing. <clears throat> and we are just uh, completing, and many of you may have seen our, our buildings that are uh, nearing completion, the Downing Square Broadway, uh, otherwise known as DSBI um, development. And th that will add 48 units um, of affordable housing to our inventory, to our stock. I just wanna give a little background. This, this graphic here is showing on the right side is a photo of one of the two sites. So the Downing Square, Downing Square is located over, uh, I guess you'd say kind of in the Heights. It's, it's uh, at the, the intersection of Park and Lowell and um, I'm not sure, Westminster, I think. Uh, it's a, it's a, the crazy intersection that uh, folks call the intersection from hell sometimes. Um, and then the other site is this one that's shown in the photo here on Broadway at 117 Broadway. So the total of the projects, again, includes 48 units. In the building that you see on the right here, there are 16 units, uh, 14 units, sorry. And there, there was also a commercial space on the ground floor, uh, which is going to be occupied by the Arlington Eats food pantry, food market uh, program. Um, the other, there's two buildings at the other site, um, the Downing Square site. The larger building has 34 units, smaller unit has uh, six units. You probably, if you've gone through that intersection, you probably have more a visual recognition of the six unit building, which is right at the corner. The 32 unit building sits back, um, really fronting along the, uh, the bicycle path uh, primarily looking across the bike path at the Arlington Coal and Lumber uh, uh, yard there. Just to give some background on this project, and I, first I wanna, I wanted people to know that I'm an architect. I'm not actually a development um, expert uh, in the sense that I'm not a developer. I'm an architect who has uh, been on the board of the Housing Corporation for a while, and we um, have done a lot of uh, projects in Arlington, so I'm very familiar with Arlington, um, but I'm kind of I'm kind of playing a developer on TV here for, for tonight. So um, the project, the total development cost of the two combined project, the two sites is a little over, it's about twenty five and a half million dollars. So uh, twenty five point, about twenty five point four million dollars at this point. Um, the direct construction cost of the two projects combined is about $16.5 million. The, uh, the, the two different sites, the one on Broadway that you see here, we that was purchased by the Housing Corporation in 2014 for about a million dollars, $995,000 for the site. You may recall that on this site, um, the Arlington, uh, food pantry operated uh, until, uh, well, until we, just before we started construction, uh, there was, I think there was a diner on this site that was, uh, that was used. And um, on the other site, which was purchased for about 1.4 million, um, that site uh, over again at Downing Square, uh, that site it was purchased by the Housing Corporation in 2016 it had some serious uh, environmental contamination, which were, was remediated. It uh, was projected to cost about $550,000 to remediate. It, I think it ended up costing uh, somewhere around $720,000 to remediate. Um, some serious remediation that took place on that site. Uh, there was PCBs and lead and other chemicals that were remediated through a very uh, thorough um, uh, department of an environment department uh, process of remediation, which if any of you in the audience are in, in the neighborhood, live in the neighborhood over by Downing Square, you know that there were community meetings and there was a very thorough process around informing folks about the remediation there. Anyway, um, just to get back to a little bit about the, the project and who will live in these buildings, um, of the, the total 48 units, 
32 of the units are at or below 60% uh, of the adjusted median income for the area. And just so you are aware of that, what that means for, um, let's see if I have that. I don't think I have, oh yeah, okay. Uh, for 60%, the um, uh, for a family of four, the, the maximum income is 76,700. Oh, well, let's see. And, oh, well, you don't have 60% on it, you have 50%. Yeah. But uh, for 60%, it's seven, 76,740,000 maximum income. Um, for family of four, for a single person, it's 53,760. Um, for the 30%, uh, according to my chart here, what we, oh, this is as, as of April, 2020. That's why the numbers may be a little different. But um, family of four, 38,370 and a single family, 26,880 uh, for the, those income levels. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the, the buildings, they are um, highly energy efficient. Uh, they have all electric heating and cooling. They have, um, uh, the, the two larger buildings both have elevators. Uh, they have, uh, again, very, very tight uh, building envelopes um, for energy efficiency. And uh, let's see what else. Uh, they, um, they obviously they have to meet all the building codes, including the stretch energy code, which is the most current energy uh, requirements for all buildings in Massachusetts. Um, the, uh, as you can see from the listed special features, we have um, Arlington Eats food pantry on the ground floor. As I mentioned, we have the roofs are all designed for they're solar ready. They, the panels will likely be installed in coming months for uh, solar panels on the roofs. And um, I think it's worth really pointing out, uh, especially on the Downing Square site, what um, tremendous level of contamination was remediated. And particularly because that site is, uh, it's, it's within the 100 foot and the 50 foot um, wetlands buffer zone that runs along the bike path there, there's an aquifer underground. And so the remediation is really a key important thing, both for the site as well as for the community. Um, and um, I guess I'm just about out of time. I think I'm running down on time. So I'd be happy to answer questions that after the others, other folks have presented. Well, if you want to take a minute to just talk about the financing sources, oh, yeah. I, I know this isn't your I area should. of expertise, but it's it's cool to see how much leverage the town got for right. its investment in this project. Right. So, uh, yeah, I am remiss in not mentioning the funders. If there's any funders on the on the uh, call today, um, well, I'm an architect, so uh, forgive me. But um, yes, there was there was about. Um, $12 million, uh, there was $10 million of, of federal uh, low-income housing tax credits. There was a, another uh, about $7.6 million of state subsidies, uh, including housing innovation fund, housing stabilization, stabilization funds, affordable housing trust funds from mass housing and, and state low-income housing tax credits. Also a really big important um, thing that is the benefit of being in Arlington is that there was $600,000 of Community Preservation Act funds that went into the project and about $250,000 of Community Development Block Grant, CDBG funds uh, that went into the, to the project in terms of subsidies. Leader Bank is providing a, a $3.5 million um, mortgage and um, there was also about two and a half million dollars of, of home funds or federal funds provided through the North Suburban Home Consortium, which Arlington is a part of. Uh, it's run out of the out of uh, the Med, uh, sorry Malden Redevelopment Authority offices, but uh, we are a part of that consortium and 
and the consortium provided us with $2.47 million there. A lot of different sources of subsidy are required to make these things happen. You see all the different sec sectors of the pie of how, how to make the financing work. Um, I'm sure you'll hear more and probably in better description from the other development folks here who are actual developers and not architects. Um, just wanna say though, again, how, how wonderful and thankful we are to be in Arlington because the town of Arlington has provided really a, a lot of support, both in terms of planning, in terms of the zoning, in terms of um, subsidy dollars and support to the housing corporation. And um, it's really, it's a great town. It's a, it's a great town as we all know who live here, but it's a great town to um, in its support of affordable housing. And there's of course a lot more to do, so. There. Since Abby won't say it because she's also on the board, I just want to uh, appreciate the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Our town is very lucky to have a dedicated community development corporation that is producing additional affordable housing and maintaining the housing that they have. So thank you to all of you who have been a part of it over the many years. We're very lucky to have you here. Thank you, Karen. And I would just like to ask one thing, uh, Neil, to focus on, there were 48 units. Could you speak to how many applications you received? Oh, yes. For yes, we, we uh, as, as I mentioned, we, uh, we are just about finishing the, and just about to open this project, probably, uh, well, we're at 99%. We're expecting to get our certificates of occupancy in the next two to three weeks. We had a lottery um, for, potential new residents that uh, income qualify. We got over 500 applications. I don't remember the exact number, like 515 or something like that for the 48 units that we have available. So um, obviously there's very strong demand for these. These are rental units. I should be clear about that again, they're rental units. And um, you know, the, the successful lottery winners, we are now in a process of uh, going through and doing uh, income verification and um, uh, all the hoops and hurdles that, that those future residents have to go through to actually become residents in our, in our development. Thank you. Thank you so much Neil, uh, for that comprehensive overview. And this is just the best example of what our town has helped create for its current and future residents. And we look forward to the discussion. Uh, I am. I think I'm moving on, Karen. And in the interest of time, yes. I think up next is um, is Sean Hope, yes. Hope Real Estate Enterprises. I know he has managed to find his way in. Sean, are you with us? Yes, I am. <clears throat> and uh, welcome. Thank you, Karen, for having me. And uh, I'm excited to share a project in Cambridge. Um, so I'm here to talk about Frost Terrace. Frost Terrace is a 40 unit, 100 percent affordable development, which is a rental project in Cambridge. If you're familiar with the Porter Square area, this is uh, about two blocks from the Porter Square train. So it is indeed a transit oriented development. And at the Porter Square train station, there is grocery store, pharmacy, hardware store. So all the things that families and individuals would really need to be able to have a sense of place. So this is really what made this a special project. Um, this is done in partnership with uh, Capstone Communities. Um, any of you who are in the affordable housing world, you know Jason Korb. Uh, he has done a, a several projects, and this is uh, he and I's second project together. Uh, Frost Terrace just recently opened back in uh, August of this year. So we fought through COVID, through delays, um, and we are proud to say that we are fully leased up. So we have all of our apartments rented. And uh, you know, with COVID and all the things that we all go through to build this housing, when you actually see people occupying and families occupying the, the units, it actually all starts to make sense. Sometimes when you're dealing with all the minutia, uh, it can be challenging. Um, so a little bit, so as I mentioned, there's 40 units. Uh, we have 32 units that are at 60% of the AMI. Um, we have four units that are below 50, and we have four others that are deeply affordable, also at the 30% AMI level. Um, the site is comprised of four buildings. So um, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm actually looking at uh, this picture. So this front mansard 
Um, this is a historic restoration. This originally sat about 40 feet back from the street and there was a large parking area in front. So we picked up the house, moved it forward to the street. And then the building in the uh, background, that is a modern uh, 28 unit attachment. So that was a, a, a marvel to, to create. And then um, behind these two buildings are two single family homes that we are, are also part of the development. And those are now uh, three units each. So really we took a bunch of single families that had frankly one person living in them. And uh, thank you and, and thanks to the uh, city of Cambridge, the affordable housing trust, uh, several agencies at the state mass housing, and I will name them later on, we were able to also purchase those houses. So this was really now three parcels combined into one to create uh, 40 units of affordable housing. Um, so this was really a five-year project. Um, this was a 40B project. So we were by comprehensive permit. Um, and uh, one of the notable parts about this development um, is that we only have three accessible parking spaces. And that was intentional because oftentimes in development, you're trading units for parking. As we all know in the business, underground parking is exponentially ex expensive. And when you're in an urban area near transit, uh, I think long-term housing is much more valuable than parking spaces, which can often sit empty. So that was an, a challenge in the neighborhood, um, but we were able to prevail. And um, the handicapped parking spaces are what were required by the state and by the building code. So essentially, this is a, a, a truly transit-oriented development, and they, several of our families, as I mentioned, can walk to all the services they need. So in many ways, this is a test case uh, for the city of Cambridge, because uh, as people may know, Cambridge talks a lot about uh, uh, being uh, environmentally friendly and pushing the limits on non-automobile trans transit. And so this was really uh, an opportunity for them to support. Uh, something that we felt was in line with um, what they were promoting. Um, so then I'll speak a little bit to the affordability of, of Frost Terrace. So um, Frost Terrace has a range of income, as I mentioned, 30, 50, and 60% of the AMI, and majority are 60% of the area median income. And so for a, uh, for a family of four, the range is between, to income qualifies between 35,000 and 71,000. And um, as of two nineteen, as, as of opening for a three bedroom, the rents uh, rents plus utilities would range from nine hundred twenty four dollars to eighteen hundred dollars. So even at the at the max eighteen hundred dollars, the market rate three bedroom in this area is going for north of five thousand uh, dollars for new construction. So as you can see, this is tremendously uh, discounted from what the market has. Um, but again, most of our residents are, are working, um, are working the same jobs, frankly, that are most hard hit by COVID, uh, the service jobs, the high touch jobs. So really right now, we're just really happy to be able to open this building at a time where folks in this income bracket really need the most. Um, thank you for this slide. Yep, so this slide shows, um, and this is really an important slide because this is all the money and the sources behind this. You know, oftentimes a developer, people see us, but without these agencies and the support, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, so as you can see, um, the, the city subsidy was tremendous. Uh, so Cambridge, uh, the, frankly, the, the way we're able to get so many projects funded by the state is because the city oftentimes puts in significant money to buy the land and acquisition costs, even before a state application is filed, even before there's any zoning in place. So in this case, essentially, it was a $10 million commitment. Um, and I think it was closer to $8 million to buy, buy all the parcels. But they did this at the very beginning. And then we spent the next three years trying to get this permitted and constructed. So in this case, um, in the end, it was about $12.8 million from the city. Um, so the state subsidy is also tremendous. Um, there's $4 million in state subsidy. This is a rental LIHTC uh, deal. So, you know, mass housing was involved uh, in the state subsidy. There was also, excuse me, the federal subsidy is, is the LIHTC subsidy at $9.7 million. Um, and then we have a, a host of other sources and uses. Um, this particular deal didn't have home funds, but I did hear uh, Neil uh, talk about home funds. And again, uh, to do these deals, as most of the folks on this call know, you have to really pass together several different sources. Um, also want to say that uh, Rothman Trust provided uh, $17.7 million in funding. Um, 8.7 of that was in a construction loan. 
in a $9 million in uh, low income housing, uh, low income housing tax credit equity uh, that we provided. Um, those tax credit uh, equity were purchased by Stratford Capital um, and they have a permanent construction loan that, that will be in place once we're stabilized at $4.2 million. Um, so again, uh, several sources, both state, federal and private funds um, were involved to be able to make this happen. Um, at a total development cost of $31 million uh, for 40 units, uh, you can say that, that that is significant. And one of the challenges that we all face is that as construction prices continue to rise, we don't get to pass those prices on uh, to our residents. And so we have to continue to be creative and look for ways to uh, cut costs while maintaining high quality. And um, one of the ways we were able to do that was by eliminating parking and putting it into materials. Sean, you've alluded to how complex the financing is here, and you talked about a bunch of things that people don't see on the page. Um, I have a question for you about the financing of affordable housing and how is it different from market rate housing? I see that there's a mortgage loan on here that the property is going to pay. Is it true that if this were market rate, you'd really maybe just have one source, maybe that in your own equity, and you'd need to have rents high enough to pay the entire $31 million somehow? Yeah, um, so in general, um, I wish it was more different. We always say, you know, as a developer, we have the same guarantees, right? So we have to guarantee the same mortgage. And if this was a market rate deal, right, then we'd have, we could charge more rents, we could be protected in a different way. We might even be able to exchange the property to somebody else easily if the property wasn't going well. So we don't have that option, right? So we have a covenant. Um, with the city of Cambridge that this has to be affordable in perpetuity. Um, and there is a mortgage payment on that. And so again, um, you know, we have to make the, we have to make uh, the mortgage payments, but we also have to show in trend, negative trend, that this, that essentially the property will be able to finance itself out for 20 years. And so uh, that's challenging, right? Because there's a lot of unknowns. We don't get to necessarily raise uh, rents with the market. So if the market swings up, our, our, our rents are tied to a very different standard as we all know. Um, so I would say from a developer standpoint, the risks are a lot uh, the same. Uh, the rewards are fixed based on a fee, based on a development. And uh, again, you know, this, this mortgage payment, um, again, you know, we have a lot of debt, right? And that's intentional. These, these, these projects are loaded with debt. Um, but, uh, and I, I don't know if people on this call have experienced this, but developers in affordable housing write checks. If you don't lease up, if you have a problem with construction, if you have a shortfall, there's nobody else. It's Jason and I that would come and write a check. So uh, I often tell people that this, you know, there's a lot more, there's, so maybe to your point, Karen, there's several different sources, there's several different lenders that we have to contend with and compliance is a huge piece. Um, but at the same time, with the risk are, are, are in many ways just as great as a market rate development. So it's. It's not something that you do uh, uh, for, for, the, for the money, um, but these projects have impacts. And when you have great state and city resources to help make these projects happen, um, it, it really does give you the confidence that even through challenging times like COVID, um, that you're still gonna be able to make these projects work. We have to move on to the next one, but we didn't invite you to tell us a little bit about yourself. I think you're a hometown developer, and I, I just want to invite you to say a few words about yourself. And for everyone's reference, the bios of all of our panelists are available on the event website. Uh, thanks, Karen. Yes, so I am a fourth generation Canterbridgean. Uh, my, my grandparents immigrated uh, from the Caribbean uh, to Cambridge in the 40s, but we already had some family here prior to that. And uh, to do this work in a city that I live in uh, is, is uh, it's rewarding. I, and I, I'm honored to do it, frankly. I'm a, I'm a zoning attorney by trade. So I only started speaking affordable housing about five, six years ago. It's his own language and there's a culture uh, around it. Um, Jason has been a great partner um, and the city of Cambridge has also been uh, a great partner. So um, I love seeing people who look like me return uh, to, a, to a city that's really unaffordable for many people. And also the income diversity is something that has really left Cambridge. And so those are two things that uh, are really rewarding for me and I enjoy doing in Cambridge. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for sharing that we can preserve 
what we love while creating spaces that help meet the need of the of the town. So thank you so much for that. Our, our next speakers are a duo from the planning office for urban affairs, uh, a nonprofit housing developer affiliated with the Archdiocese of Boston. And we have the president and the development and policy project manager. Uh, please welcome Bill, Bill Grogan and Amaryllis Rodriguez. Great, uh, thank you very much. I'll uh, kick things off on, on our end. Uh, I'm Bill Grogan, I'm the president of the Planning Office for Urban Affairs and excited to be uh, with everyone this evening and share with you a couple of our recent uh, affordable housing and mixed income developments that we're currently working on in Boston. Uh, I'm here with my colleague uh, Amaryllis and I'll be briefly describe our Boynton Station Village development, which is located in the Mattapan neighborhood of Boston and she'll describe our 41 LaGrange uh, development, which is in downtown Boston. Uh, as was mentioned, the planning office is a nonprofit housing developer affiliated with the Archdiocese of Boston. Our mission is to serve as a catalyst for social justice through our work in housing development, affordable housing advocacy, and neighborhood revitalization. And at the core of our mission is a belief that housing is a human right and affordable, safe, stable housing has always been important, but I think as we've seen during the current pandemic, it's critical now more than ever. Um, since our inception, we've developed, uh, in 1969, we've developed about 10,000 units, uh, 3,000 units, I'm sorry, of affordable and mixed income housing. Uh, and we currently have about another 500 units under active development. And our housing work is really focused on responding to the needs of the communities that we're working in. And you know, I think both the Morton Station Village and uh, 41 LaGrange illustrate that. And turning to Morton Station Village, um, it's helpful to, I think, go through a little bit of background and history of, of the property and, and the site. Um, in 2016, the city of Boston issued an RFP for uh, the site, which had long been vacant uh, and was a former home to Boston uh, Police Department. Um, uh, but it was located adjacent to Morton Station stop on the uh, MBTA Fairmount line. Uh, and the city really was interested in converting this into a transit oriented development that would provide mixed income housing. Um, at the same time, an important part of it was the creation of a uh, public park that could honor a 13 year old boy who was the victim of a, of a stray bullet just uh, steps away from his home. I think understanding these objectives, you know, we partnered with a, a new community-based organization in Mattapan uh, to respond to the RFP. Uh, and our response was uh, initially a 38 unit mixed income rental development. Uh, and we were selected by the city, um, but as it described, you know, that has evolved a little bit over time. Uh, following our selection uh, th throughout 2017 and 18, we worked with the community to refine and revise our original development plan and approach. And through the community process we undertook, uh, several highlights came out of it. First, there was a strong desire to incorporate home ownership housing into the development. And so we slightly increased the size to 40 units, but we made nine of those units be home ownership and ultimately increased that to 12. Uh, there was an interest in providing a preference for artist housing. So we worked to incorporate that into development. Uh, and then it was important to include a large community room that could be connected to the public park and garden uh, to allow both public indoor and outdoor space. Um, and I think this slide highlights some of the key attributes of the development plan um, that really create a, a diverse range, uh, you know, affordable units for a diverse range of households from 30% of area median income up to 120% of area median income. And so this work with the community was uh, that we refined over this period of time led us to really uh, have an efficient and, uh, and productive sort of zoning path. We were able to secure permitting uh, over about a five month period of time. Uh, and, then that was, and then the next part we worked on uh, was securing the financing. Uh, and I think on the you know, next slide, we'll sort of break down the various sources that, uh, that we assembled over 2019 and 2020 with partnerships with the city of Boston, Mass Housing Finance Agency, and the Department of Housing and Community Development. And I think there are a couple of highlights that are uh, worth noting. You know, first, given the, that this was a city lot, the city uh, made the land available for nominal consideration. Uh, that gave us more flexibility in terms of developing programming that could be responsive to community needs. Uh, and the city also made a significant uh, financial contribution to the development. Uh, 
Uh, and then I think that you know, the other item that's worth highlighting is really sort of the push and pull of the development process uh, can have resource implications and, and impact feasibility. After we obtained all of our financing, we were asked by the community to explore the feasibility of increasing the number of home ownership units from nine to 12. Uh, and this change you know, created a financing gap for us because we had to reduce our rental housing subsidies and the sales proceeds from the home ownership uh, units weren't sufficient to cover that reduction. And so it really, you know, frankly, you know, took a lot of flexibility on the part of our financing partners between the city of Boston, between Mass Housing, to work to, to bring in additional resources to meet that community need. And I think that really speaks to, you know, the need for this to be a partnership on, on all levels. And then finally, you know, I'll just mention that if we have time later on, we can talk about sort of the complexities of trying to accommodate sort of a mixed tenure approach with rental and, and home ownership housing that that, that brings. Um, but I'll stop there for, for right now and, and turn it over to, uh, to Amaryllis to describe the 41 LaGrange Street development. So can I just ask one quick question before we go to 41 LaGrange? Of course. Can just talk about the very low income units here and the vouchers, because the numbers of units seem to be the same, and I wonder if you could speak to that. Sure. Yeah. One of one of the you know certainly one of the challenges with uh, with, with underwriting uh, you know ex extremely very low income units at thirty percent AMI is the is the rent levels for those units. So we have historically tried to match those up with operating assistance and, and vouchers. Uh, so in this case, the seven MRVP vouchers. Uh, do line up with uh, the seven units that we are providing uh, at 30% of area median income. Uh, and those units are actually will be uh, targeted uh, through the city of Boston's uh, homeless set aside. So those individuals and households will be coming, you will be formerly homeless individuals who will be coming off of uh, through the city's process and through the city's waiting list to accommodate them and helping them move in. Um, and one of the other challenges, in addition to that, is that you know as, as they're coming in with limited rent resources, is also having you know limited ability to you know things we take for granted, being able to uh, you know outfit their own uh, their own uh, units. And so we're working with uh, you know to bring in resources to help them make that transition and help them take that first step. Thanks. So Amaryllis, sorry I cut you off before you can oh, even no. get going. <laughs> no worries. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for having us um, and, and to the audience. We look forward to the discussion. Uh, so as Bill said, I'm going to share a little bit about our 41 LaGrange Street development. Uh, and to start, I'll just say that, uh, you know, this isn't necessarily the kind of development that we would uh, recommend or pursue for um, you know, many uh, Massachusetts uh, towns like Arlington, right? This, this kind of development really makes sense uh, for its location um, uh, in an already built up dense uh, area as an infill site. Um, so with that said, uh, 41 LaGrange uh, will be a new construction, 19 story, 126 unit tower. 100% affordable uh, and all rental. Uh, and I made a, a little mistake in the categories uh, when I sent this into the team. So we actually have, uh, we'll have um, 37 of those 126 units are, will be at 80% AMI, uh, 17 at 60% AMI, two at 50% AMI, and then the 70 at, um, 30% uh, AMI or below. Uh, so as you can see, it, we're, we have really deep affordability here. Um, and uh, those 70 uh, units will also be targeted uh, to uh, households that have experienced and are transitioning from homelessness. Uh, we can't necessarily guarantee that all of those units will go to those households because of uh, Fair housing regulations and, and the like, um, but we can work with those regulations and existing city processes, as Bill mentioned, um, in order to support that preference. And uh, part of that, re the reason for, for this targeting, um, besides our own 
uh, mission as an organization is this is a uh, this development is uh, the partnership between the planning office and St. Francis House, which is uh, the largest day shelter uh, in the state, I believe. Um, and it's actually located just a half a block away across the street. Um, and it's also this uh, tower will represent the, the second phase of a two phase development. Uh, so the first phase, uh, which we call the Union at 48 Boylston, uh, is uh, located directly across the street from St. Francis House. And uh, that uh, renovated the uh, historic um, Victorian Gothic uh, former home of the Boston Young Men's Christian Union. Uh, which many people knew and loved as their community gym. Um, and it also was home to offices. Um, so uh, that uh, development created uh, 46 units of 100% affordable housing, um, 26 of which were uh, targeted to, to um, households that have experienced homelessness. Uh, and as a part of that process, uh, we uh, demolished non-historic portions of that building. Um, I believe they were squash courts. Um, and so 41 LaGrange will, uh, is located directly behind uh, the union, um, which we, that we call it, and uh, where those squash courts used to be. Uh, so in a sense, you know, mm -hmm. we kind of went through the Article 80 process twice um, in terms of permitting. Um, first for that demolition and then for the building itself. So certainly an extensive uh, review process. Uh, we also had um, uh, challenges in terms of uh, uh, disagreements with an abutter, which had us go into arbitration, unfortunately delaying us for more than a year. Um, but we received a uh, decision in our favor earlier this year. Um, uh, and we're currently in the process of, of finalizing um, plans uh, for the tower. So, you know, one, one theme that you can pull out there is just how long these things take. And, you know, this is a long term partnership between the planning office and St. Francis House that began before my time at the office. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that this is at least seven years in the making already. So um, yes, and then, you know, in the uh, total cost, um, you, some of the drivers for this include the fact that it is a, a downtown development and there's kind of a premium associated with that in terms of some of the equipment like, uh, you know, cranes and lifts and the kind of uh, methods that you have to use for construction uh, that contribute to that. Uh, but we received, you know, uh, significant support from the city, both financially and in terms of their advocacy. Um, and uh, you can see, you know, significant uh, uh, low-income housing tax credit, um, uh, Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston uh, subsidy, um, and, and significant state subsidies as well. And in order to support this development, we're going, uh, you know, we're, as Bill mentioned, we also need to use uh, Section 8 vouchers and MRVP vouchers um, to support those, uh, you know, the 30% units. And that also means uh, providing significant service supports. Um, in order to support those tenancies and, and make sure that they're successful and, you know, transitioning uh, from that experience into self-sufficiency and, and, you know, live healthy and productive lives. Um, so that's just the, the high overview, but there's so many themes there that, you know, happy to review. Thank you. It's really interesting how you guys have integrated multiple things like vouchers and, you know, affordable home ownership and the development into 
um, you know, these two projects. And I, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's really cool how you have in integrated all of those systems and thought from a very community perspective of, you know, what, what it needs and gotten there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, with that, I think we are going to move to uh, regions beyond ours. Our final speaker is the Managing Director of Preservation of Affordable Housing, POA, uh, a nonprofit developer, owner, and operator of more than 12,000 affordable homes across the country. Uh, here to talk about Melbourne Apartments from South Dennis, I'm happy to introduce Roger Brown. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for being here tonight. It's really a pleasure to be with you. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> The planning office does some really amazing work as, as do the rest of the projects that are here tonight. I'm, I'm gonna to talk to you about something that's a little bit different, but in some ways the themes continue in our project as well. Um, one of the things that uh, POA does and in the planning office as well is we frequently partner with local nonprofits. And this project is a result of a partnership a kind of a long-standing partnership series of partnerships we have with the organization on Cape Cod called the Housing Assistance Corporation. And in, in this case, and in many cases, it's kind of a, a complementary marriage. We bring um, kind of a knowledge of building buildings, and Housing Assistance Corporation brings a service component that bring that we can bring to bear in many of our developments. So I'll tell you a little bit about this one. This might be the only site you hear from tonight that was uh, formerly a, um, an amusement park. Back in 1957, it was Frontier Valley and they had a, a, a real Western town built there that people in the town would come and, uh, and, and enjoy. It was kind of an unusual site, 19 acres, had the frontier town, had a stable and, and somehow, it ended up having 12 units of public housing on one edge of the site. In 2001, the town of Dennis actually bought the site. The, the amusement park went away uh, and they took seven acres of that site or six acres of the site that contained the existing public housing units and gave it to the housing authority. Um, and the housing authority, um, ran it for a period of time, the buildings were not in great shape. In 2013, in fact, they demolished those buildings, put the site out to bid. And along with our partners, Housing Assistance Corporation, we applied to uh, be the developer and won the right to develop it. Um, it's got eight buildings, 27 units, kind of at scale for that town. Of the 27 units, they are 100% affordable at 60% of the area median income. So to give you a, a flavor of that, in Dennis, that's about $40,000 a year, give or take. So it's a relatively, relative to Massachusetts and certainly to Arlington, it's a much lower income band. But the housing need is very great. On the Cape, as you can imagine, um, getting full-time housing for workers and people who want to live there full-time and are not retirees is, is a tough thing to do. And so that's what we attempted to, the need we attempted to address with this project. Uh, the, obviously the town was very supportive of that. And you'll see when we get to the, talk about the funding that the town put in a little over a half a million dollars, probably $650,000. Um, just to go back for a minute of the, of the, 27 units, so all of them are below, are affordable to folks making $40,000 or less. Seven of them are affordable to folks that are making less than $20,000 a year. And as Karen uh, and our previous panelists talk about, we we're able to get an allocation of vouchers from the state to support the incomes of those very low income folks in, in, in those seven units. Um, one of the other distinctive things about this project from um, is that it was POA's first attempt at building extremely highly efficient, from an energy perspective, affordable housing. And so our goal here was to create a net zero housing development. So we would basically not have any energy costs. The idea there was to keep the, the operating costs down to assure the long-term stabili stability, financial stability of the project. So we did things like at the end of the day, we built the buildings uh, at about 50% more 
higher efficiency than the building code allowed. So more insulation, a lot of attention to the details of construction so we could really minimize air infiltration. We utilize very high efficiency um, HVAC equipment so we could make sure not only were we um, making sure that we had healthy buildings by having good air exchanges, but also to make sure that that equipment operated extremely efficiently. We also put photovoltaic um, on, on the roof. We put PVs on the roof so we could generate um, our own electricity. And um, I think I'll stop there, Karen. Wait, you have to talk about the financing. Oh, okay. You're <laughs> right. Uh, unlike some other projects, because our incomes are so low, we can't carry a lot of debt. So you'll see here we've got a, you know, basically a million dollar mortgage on 27 units, which is relatively low. Uh, we were helped out by a, a great deal of soft money from various pots from the, from the state. There's about a little over $2 million of that. The town chipped in with their uh, CPA funds to the tune of about $650,000 and some home money. Um, we actually left some money, we put some money in this deal, which is a little unusual because we wanted to hit that extremely high efficiency, high, extremely high efficiency building envelope it was a little more expensive. And so we put some of our own money in. And of course, we got a, a very healthy allocation of tax credits from the state, which allowed us um, to, to really minimize the amount of uh, hard debt that we carried going forward. So we could be, be assured we have a project that could last a long term without having to depend on, um, you know, drastically raising rents to cover costs. Very cool. All right. That was um, really cool, really interesting projects in very different communities, very different construction types, um, and somewhat different developers, but let's talk about um, developers a little bit. You almost all talked about doing joint ventures. And I just wonder, um, Roger, you talked about the, you, many of you talked about the joint venture, but what are the pros and cons of doing a joint venture? How do you get more out of a deal? What kind of profit does an affordable housing developer make? Is it restricted in any way? And do you have to share it when you partner? Um, could could some of you speak to that and you can sort of wave oh. your hands or lean forward. We'll, we'll There's about try to make this chatty if we can. And right. Bobby, jump in with your questions too. Um, There's about eight questions in there, Karen, but I'll take a bite at a couple of them. Uh, we partner actually with a lot of other nonprofits. They, they typically, those partnerships tend to work really well when, when we're complementary. And that mm -hmm. is to say, as in on the, as in the case on the Cape where our where our partner provides a social service package that that we can't and and they're local, um, you know we have a very good marriage because it's complementary. It gets a little more complicated when it's duplicative, mm -hmm. and so you know when we show up and we've got the same sets of skills and financial capabilities, it's a little bit tougher negotiating what what the uh, various responsibilities are. I think the finances is probably the easiest part of it because. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we, we typically look to um, split the finances in a way that, that corresponds with the risk, with the split of risk. So for example, if we're in many, in many cases, a developer will, will have to provide a guarantee of construction completion. And, and, and that is tied to you know, our balance sheet. And if we're putting the balance sheet up, we would want to be assured that you know the financial split is probably going to be a little bit more in our favor because we're taking that risk. And, and frequently, there's also an ongoing risk that Bill knows, as well as the tax credit developer, the compliance risk. And that's, and that's fully recourse. And you look to be compensated for, for that as well. And um, you know, to the extent that those things are balanced out in a transaction, then you'll look to balance the economics. And otherwise you, if in our cases, we split the economics according to the risk. And, and Karen, this is, this is Bill. I would echo what Roger said about uh, finding a complementary uh, partner. Uh, that certainly is something that drives us. I think as Amarellis described, you know, our partnership with St. Francis House 
you know, they're really, you know, providing social services, you know, they're an expert, they know, uh, they can bring to the table the resident services and how we can meet the needs of uh, individuals, households who are transitioning out of homelessness. So that, that you know, that's clearly a, a key piece of it. Um, you know, interestingly, I think, though, the other reason for partnership in our end is of how can we look to, you know, we've been using it recently to try to address, you know, racial equity issues, for example. So in uh, Morton Station Village, you know, we're partnering with Caribbean Integration Community Development. They're a they're a, they're a minority-based organization uh, that they don't have a lot of development experience, and so we're you know working with them to try to help you know, generate neighborhood wealth and value through real estate for their organization, so that they can develop a um, you know a, a balance sheet and become uh, you know in, increase the services that they can provide within the neighborhood and the community, and then hopefully over time be able to take on development efforts in in their own right. Um, you know, I think as, you know, one of the cons, uh, challenges of that situation, as, as Roger mentioned, is that typically in a partnership, you have a, a sharing of, uh, you know, of guarantees as you're sharing fees. You know, in that situation, it's a new organization. They, they don't have the assets or the balance sheet to provide guarantees. So we're having to bear that, uh, bear that risk and liability. But, you know, we're and we're also giving them a, you know, a significant percentage of developer fee to help them build their wealth. So that's sort of the, can be the trade-offs with working with uh, an organization like that. But from our end, again, it's important to help develop those types of new organizations, especially in, you know, a community like Mattapan. Um, can I ask the question about whether your fees are capped? There's a lot of subsidy in these deals. Um, is there a limit on what you can get paid as a developer? Any, uh, if there's anybody else wants to answer that, or you guys. Sure, I'll start start that. Uh, you know, the Department of Housing and Community Development does have developer fee guidelines and limitations that do limit the fee that, uh, you know, that we can receive on a particular development. It's, a, you know, basically, a, you know, a tiered structure depending upon the development costs. Uh, and again, results in a, a limitation in terms of the overall fee that can be realized on a project. Um, you know, I think increasingly, you know, certainly in, in Boston and other communities with high cost areas, we're having to, you know, uh, defer or contribute back, a, you know, a, a significant portion of our fee. Certainly, we prefer not to have to have to do that. But, you know, from our end, if that's what it takes to sort of make some of these high mission deals work, then, uh, then that's, what we're, what, that's what we're willing to do. Um, but, but yes, there are, are limitations, um, uh, you know, on the fees, um, you know, and, and I think we also have, you know, recognize that given that there are public resources that we're uh, availing ourselves on that there need to be those types of limitations. Yeah, Karen, I would say that um, the DHCD, the State Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, at least nominally, and I believe this number is still the same, has a, a TDC limit, a total development cost limit of about 400, maybe they've gone up to $420,000 a unit, which in, in, in many cases is not nearly enough. And they often go beyond that. The, the Arlington development, the, the uh, Downing Square Broadway was around 540, I think, $540,000 total development cost per unit. And from from my understanding, that is um, that fairly commonly happens. It's it's just because there is no way to build units uh, at at what has been the nominal uh, limit that the HCD has has had for a long time. I don't know if that number has gone up in recent years, but it's uh, it's still it's it's a very difficult challenge given, as you can see from the the acquisition cost of properties and. Uh, and the construction cost in the last year has gone up dramatically. So, I think you guys have hit. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was going to say. I mean, we could probably go into a little more precision about how that number is calculated, but but at a, at a very you know high level, I generally think of the cap fee at like ten percent of your total cost, and and typically, as Bill said, we you know we're we would probably expect to leave at least 25% of that fee in the deal to help us get feasibility and to keep our friends in the state happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I appreciate uh, your elaborating on that and, and just kind of laying that out. Can we talk a little bit about income levels and how you set them for a deal like this? Is there a relationship between that and the kind of money you get? Um, there's, there's a real range and I just wonder who's deciding who the project benefits? Is that you, is it the community? Is it a back and forth? Um, I'm gonna pick on Sean because we haven't heard from you in a little bit and I know you have probably had a really interesting process in the city of Cambridge. Um, sorry, um, I'm, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear Oh, sorry, it. I'm just asking about income levels. How do you determine what they are? Is that determined by the developer, the community? Uh, is it back and forth? Is it, a, is it something else? Yeah, um, so, and I think as we know recently, the area median income, they just came up with a, a reassessment. So some of our, our rents uh, were increased based on it when they, when they do a pooling of the area median income, um, but it's definitely not set by the developer. Um, and it's, it, it, it's, it's really set by our funding sources, uh, if I'm being honest, and which one of them is the city of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, generally they're, they're the same across the board, but, um, but we really have to follow the direction of our lenders and our funding sources, which are numerous. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to chime in on how the uh, income limits get set in your projects? Yeah, so, so Karen, you know, I think for ours, they sort of differ from projects. I think our two projects are examples of that. For example, on Morton Station, you know, we really wanted to have sort of a, you know, a broad diversity of, of incomes going from 30% to 120% to really meet the neighborhood and community needs. Um, and so, you know, in that instance, we sort of started from, uh, you know, the conversations with the community about, uh, about what, you know, housing needs were, what diversity of uh, the housing types that were in the neighborhood. And that sort of led sort of us so, so then sort of going from there to sort of develop sort of what would be the ultimate mix between and to enable it to be feasible. On 41 LaGrange, you know, given the partnership with St. Francis House, again, there, there was a much uh, stronger focus on our own and St. Francis House's mission to have significant, you know, 70 units as Emeril has described, set aside for formerly homeless households. So that, you know that was really more from from our collective mission and uh, ob objectives of what uh, we uh, you know trying to address a significant need within the, within the city itself. And then it was you know frankly then it's a matter of saying okay given that level of units then what what's the other mix you know sort of the push and pull I was mentioning in terms of other income levels to achieve a feasible development. But in that case again it was our you know our two organizations coming through and saying okay we want to have you know 70 of the 126 units set aside for that purpose. Bill in Mattapan you had some units I think at 120 percent of area median and some at 100. What was driving that? Yeah it, you know at the end of the day it was sort of you know the, trying to get a little bit more diversity having a there's an interest in the community of having some a little bit higher income uh, and, and you know I think that that was reflective of of having a development that reflects the, you know, the, the needs of the community. So that's what feedback we were getting from the community was to have, you know, to try to increase numbers up to that level. And it's, it, frankly, it was directly in response to the community. I was a little surprised not to see market rate, unrestricted market rate units in any of your deals. Um, have you done deals that include different income mixes, including some market rate and, and what drove that? Is it project feasibility? Is it income mixing or something else? Well, um, I'll talk about one transaction. We actually have a groundbreaking coming up next Tuesday on a 50 unit um, mixed income age restricted property in Roxbury. Um, and that, that contains a mix of public housing, tax credit units and unrestricted market units. And it was really driven by a desire of the community to have senior housing built on the site that would allow seniors that live in the surrounding neighborhood in their own and have lived in the neighborhood for a very long time, but are now living in houses that are too big for them. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be able to have a housing nearby that was unrestricted so those folks could move out of their houses into a senior community and free up those other housing resources for new families to move in. And so that kind of drove the, 
it wasn't really a city requirement. It was really kind of a negotiation with the neighborhood about what they wanted to see and the mix that they wanted to see there. And we were fortunate enough to be able to link it in with our public housing redevelopment um, at Whittier Street and, and also to coordinate with the Boston Medical Center to be able to bring in supportive services for some of our other seniors. Pretty, really interesting. And Karen, um, uh, sorry, I would just add um, that yes, you know, we we, we do do a, a mixed income housing that includes um, market rate units. Um, one example uh, from the planning office is uh, Rollins Square, um, which has a, a real uh, diverse uh, income mix, um, uh, you know, all the way from uh, households that um, you know left the city shelter system to market rate, and uh, you know we we like to uh, share kind of you know anecdotes from our experience there, where you know some a lot of people can have concerns about um, developments that are deeply affordable, um, and you know what that might mean in terms of safety or activity and you know um, things like that. Um, but, you know, we have found in our experience that a lot of, you know, market rate units have just as many issues um, as, you know, all affordable developments um, uh, and, and, you know, people dealing with, you know, mental health issues or, or substance use issues yeah. and things like that. Um, so it, it runs a, a wide gamut uh, in terms of um, the housing that we provide and why we might uh, choose one mix or another. And actually at 41 LaGrange, um, a previous iteration of the development did include uh, market rate units. Um, and, you know, a change was made there, you know, as Bill said, partly in, in because of our connection with St. Francis House um, and, and in conversation with the community um, uh, and, but also it was the result of a change in um, the tax credit rules where, uh, you know, uh, before you wouldn't be able to count like the 80% the units as um, and receive tax credits for them. Um, but once that rule was changed, you know, we were able to generate um, tax credits from those units to be able to support a greater affordability. Um, so. I just raised that to, to uh, point out how, you know, if that hadn't been the case, then we would still be considering market rate units in that development, um, partly for, you know, the, the social benefit of having a diverse population within the building and not isolating, uh, you know, um, um, the households that are coming from the shelter system. Um, and so that they could build, you know, greater social capital and the like, um, uh, but also to, to cross subsidize those units. So there is a benefit to that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, we've got about five more minutes. Um, so I just wanna, Abby, give you a chance to jump in if you have a question. Yeah, I just had a quick question um, and starting with Sean about like the permitting process because the for, uh, Frost Terrace was the only 40B development. And so how did that make a difference in like the development time or just overall uh, in the process? And, you know, similarly for, uh, I would just like to throw it out the, uh, to uh, other speakers as well. Like how did the uh, permitting impact? The um, I think it's a great question. So Cambridge is our, our, uh, has exceeded its uh, it's 10% of his housing stock being affordable. So every 40B is discretionary for the zoning board to even hear the matter. And then also they are not bound by the same uh, strictures under 40, under 40B if they were under 10%. So basically uh, in Cambridge to do a comprehensive permit uh, approval, there's a lot of community negotiation. Um, you know, typically you're obviously a, 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 um, providing affordable housing, but oftentimes people just see the building, the size and the dimensions. So in this case, um, there were probably exponential costs that we had to do to appease our neighbors because it was affordable, for instance. Um, so the, our building, which should be five stories, we had to have half of the fifth story cut back because of light and air issues from our neighbors. Um, there's some irony because we were the same height as them. So if they're blocking us, we'd be blocking them, but that's a concession. 
So there were lots of other design details that if we weren't doing a 40B, we probably could have avoided. Um, but at the same time, we got increased density. And I do think when you're doing 100% affordable housing, there is a level of which as a developer, people understand that um, you may need a little more density and uh, hopefully they like the project a little bit more because it really is tapping into a need. So um, that was my experience. Can I ask about existing buildings? It just so happens that all, all of these developments are mostly new construction. I know, Sean, you have the um, renovation of some historic homes in yours as well. But um, do, uh, can you speak to whether you also have done projects where you are either preserving existing affordable housing using these same financing sources, um, or, and maybe there may be opportunities to do this in Arlington and it may be of, of particular interest to acquiring existing buildings that are not affordable and restricting them as affordable moving forward. What, what does that take? Um, I, I deliberately was looking for a project amongst you guys that, that, that met that last um, description and it was hard to find. Why is that? So let's see, Karen, I could, I could yeah, talk Yeah, go ahead. I can talk about Arlington, um, the, kind of the history of the Housing Corp of Arlington really started with us purchasing two family, private two family homes that were not affordable. We just, we purchased them on the market with uh, a variety of different subsidy sources. And we have, we now, we, we actually purchased through a period of, um, I guess probably about eight or nine years, um, 14, two family uh, buildings that are all affordable. And um, in a lot of ways, it, it's, it's a great solution. It's a great solution for affordable housing because it's very much, it avoids the, the concentration of a large number of lower income folks together. And, and the whole idea of income mixing and culture mixing and racial diversity and so on is um, it's really, kind of wonderful. In many cases of our, the 14 buildings that we have, many people don't even know which, which house or which building is an affordable house or, or affordable residents live there. The one drawback to that is that it's very difficult to do the property management on that kind of a setup. The, the scattered uh, two families are extremely uh, expensive to manage. We've also developed a number of bigger projects. In fact, the probably the most well-known project is, is our Capitol Square project, which is 32 units um, on Mass Ave in Arlington, uh, which was an existing private apartment uh, complex of uh, three buildings, I think it is, and uh, was renovated. And uh, it's now 100% affordable. And again, it's it has some benefits in terms of getting into a, a neighborhood. It, it, architecturally, it's a historic, they're historically kind of appropriate. They were historic buildings and they have uh, a number of benefits to, to fitting in and not having kind of the stigma of coming in and either tearing a building down or taking an open space that, that may be you know, a, a highly prized open space in the community. So, um, and our Downing Square Broadway project is really the first new construction that we that we've done. And, as, as I mentioned, we're, you know, we, a large part of that is on a, a site that was a environmental hazard. And so, you know, bringing that back to life, but um, the, there are, there are benefits to working with existing housing stock. It's just that actually in a town like Arlington, it's so expensive now there, there we, to actually get a hold of development opportunities that um, we have a hard time. That's, that's probably the biggest, uh, impediment right now is finding development opportunities that are not just astronomically expensive. Um, Roger, were you, got, were you leaning in there? Thank you. Oh, I was, you know, we are, I was going to say we're, we're, it's very difficult to, uh, to acquire and bring, you know, unrestricted market, unrestricted units into your affordable portfolio. Price is one thing, but the other thing that we find frequently is a, uh, our funding sources are tied to the income levels of the residents. And many times it's hard to ascertain um, 
what the income levels of the existing residents are, and they're not used to providing the level of uh, documentation and information that's required, for example, to do a tax credit uh, execution where we need to know that someone's making less than 60% of area median income and they've been going along for years just paying their rent and now they have to come and you know get interrogated <laughs> about all their personal information so that's that's kind of difficult we're we're attempting to do something like that on an existing asset in Chicago right now it happens to be right across the street or right up the street from the new Obama presidential library so it's at risk of being lost to the naturally occurring affordable stock. Mm -hmm. um, a, the, a bank owned it. So we're trying to work with the bank and we'll probably end up with an execution that involves some level of tax credit and tax exempt financing uh, on some number of units, but we'll probably have to create a separate entity to hold the non-tax credit units in and try mm -hmm. to finance them on their own. It's just you know, it's a 300 unit property and the city's really um, concerned about having it lost, that kind of scale lost to naturally occurring right. affordable housing. Ultimately, it will probably also involve a big check coming from the city of Chicago to keep it affordable. Yeah. This has been so great, but we got to open this up to the um, audience. Abby, do you have any uh, last burning question before we do that? Uh, no, I think I think we are going to open it up to the audience. But before we do that, I just want to quickly clarify that since we are short on time and we have speakers only, you know, uh, up till seven thirty, unless they agree to stay beyond. Uh, but so I'm going to keep the questions up till just one minute. I really request all of you to uh, keep the questions precise so we can, you know, get more information from the speakers. And so with that, uh, please do raise your hands if you have a question, and I'm happy to. Yeah. Jennifer, go ahead. You. Hi. Go Sorry. Ahead. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Ms. Rodriguez mentioned a project that she was involved in uh, being delayed for a year because of a a, um, a butter lawsuit, and I'm sure others have experienced delays in projects. And I was wondering what that does to the financing. So, uh, do, do do you have to? pare down the project in some way, because I know every delay increases costs. Um, does that affect the amount of affordability you can offer? Does it just affect your profit? Sort of um, what has happened in projects that you've been involved with when there have been delays? Bill, you wanna take that? Sure, I'll jump in. And, and I think, Jennifer, you raise a great point about the uh, the impact of, of delays. Um, and I think they, they do fall in a couple of areas. One is just sort of the the, the cost, you know, the, the as Amaryllis mentioned, we were in, you know, spent a year in arbitration. Uh, you don't want to know what the legal costs are that we had to incur as a result of that. Um, they're just, you know, uh, you know, pretty significant. And so what, what does that mean? That means that it has to be rolled into our development budget. So that increases our overall uh, costs for the project. Uh, and then the second piece is that to the delay, you know, unfortunately in the market that we're in uh, with the delay construction costs have gone up over the past, you know, you know, 12 plus months that we've been, we're, we're delayed by that arbitration. So you factor that into, and our you know construction costs have have risen by you know 15, 20 percent over over that period of time, um, and then you know as a result of that, we end up having to go back with our lenders and try to you know we had commitments based upon one cost set of assumptions. A year and a half later, when we're through with the uh, with the arbitration, construction costs have increased. We have to go back and request you know seek additional resources or look to restructure the, the deal and maybe the you know the income mix that we were originally proposing isn't isn't possible and have to look at something else in order to try to uh, generate more sources to cover those increased costs um, and and typically the financing does have set time frames you know for example on our 41 Lagrange you know we had a federal home loan bank affordable housing commitment uh, that's probably, uh, I shouldn't admit how, how, how old that is right now, but we've had to work with them to keep them updated, to continue to roll that over. So that, that is at risk uh, as part of that. But, you know, fortunately, you know, mo you know, most of the lenders and the state agencies understand and are willing to work with you, but um, it does have significant imp impact on cost, resources, 
And, you know, it, it, as we have sort of a limited supply of resources to cover affordable housing, it just reduces what can go around, unfortunately. See, I, I, would also, I would also just like to say that uh, in the case of the Housing Corporation of Arlington, which is a nonprofit, um, we, you know, we, and, and like the other developers, to some extent, we need to kind of live from project to project. So we need to survive on the developer fee that may be generated from one project and hope that it's gonna carry us through through the next project. We also, as a nonprofit, we can do fundraising um, and we have, and the, house, the, the, the uh, uh, residents of Arlington and many other people, some of the banks and so on have been very generous. There is this, uh, this uh, state tax credit called the Community Investment Tax Credit, which uh, nonprofit CDCs, Community Development Corporations, can, um, can take donations and there's a 50% tax credit. It's, a very, it's pretty remarkable what for, for uh, those who can make that kind of a donation. And, and the Housing Corp of Arlington has for, for many years and thanks you know, very largely to our previous executive director, Pam Hallett, we have taken in you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of donations that have been matched through this CITC program. And that, that's one of many ways that we have um, been able to survive. Um, but for example, we on, the, on our Downing Square project, we ran into very severe difficulties with our friends at Eversource, the utilities not being able to hook up the electric um, in time, we, we basically lost about two months of time, which includes two months of lost rent, two months of impact on our low-income housing tax credits, two months worth of um, extra overhead that the contractor had to charge. It, it probably cost us $200,000 uh, just in the, the delays because of the utility company. And, you know, we, there's any number of delays that, that uh, affordable housing developers and all developers, but um, particularly affordable housing developers are on a shoestring that have to face these kind of delays. It's, it's, it's pretty challenging to make, uh, to keep the continuity and make it work. So. And if I can add um, that two month delay is also a family not being able to live in that house for you know, those two months. That's right, probably the most important thing, Abby, yeah. Uh, I, I can move on to the next one, uh, Rebecca Gruber. You wanna, go ahead. Yes, thank you. This is very interesting. Um, I had one question. None of your presentations described the type of units you were making available. One bedroom, two bedroom, family. And I know that in Arlington, affordable housing for families is a particular uh, need that we have. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what choices you make in regard to the type of units you're making available in your developments. I can, I can just give you a quick rundown on the Arlington units. Well, actually I probably can't because I, I have to add them up, but we have 48 units in our new development. It's a mix of ones, twos, and threes. Um, there are, I believe, 17 one bedrooms. Um, let's see, there's the, the, the sweet, stop, sweet spot is generally two bedrooms. So there's, there's probably around 20 something two bedrooms and there's uh, I'm seeing about seven three bedrooms in in our development based on what we could fit and what we thought would would be rentable and of those we also have um, at least uh, five percent of the units are handicapped accessible all all of the units in the elevator buildings are considered handy handicapped um, adaptable or uh, group one units and there's 5% at least, and I believe it's more than that, but are fully accessible units. Yeah, I think that's it's a good question, Rebecca. And I think that, you know, from our perspective, a lot of it depends upon, you know, again, what our goals are from a project we're going in to upfront. On our Morton Station development, 75% uh, of the units are two and three bedroom units. So they're more targeted to, you know, to families. Whereas on our 41 Lagrange uh, development, uh, you know, majority of those are studios and one bedrooms because we're targeting a you know different household 
you know, for ind for individuals coming out of uh, out of homelessness. So, you know, part of it depends upon the community that we're working in and really what the needs of the community are, um, and, and trying to develop a, a a mix that is reflective of that. Thank you, Bill. Uh, uh, we can now take a question from Winell, if I'm saying that right. Winell. Yeah. It's Winnell. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all the presenters. This is a, a really interesting evening, um, and I've, I've learned a lot from this. I have a question for Neil. Um, you talked about the breakdown of costs, the combined costs for the Broadway and the Downing Square projects, um, and there was about five million unaccounted for in your <laughs> In your listing of costs between land acquisition, construction, and remediation, and I wonder if you could share with us how that five million dollars is dispersed. Uh, I probably can't, Winnell, because as and I apologize because I said as I said I'm I'm a board member, I'm um, an architect, and I was not the I was not the person who put together the deal. If I if there is unaccounted for. Uh, Money. I'm happy to send you our um, a copy of our uh, sources and uses to make sure that you can understand where where all the money came to and, and went to. Sure. Um, yeah. But, um, so I apologize. It, it could be also. I think it's possible that in the information that was that was sent to um, the organizers here, that some of the some of the funds, some of the subsidies may may not have been fully. Um, uh categorized so again i apologize i'm i'm others here are developers i'm an architect and okay. i don't have all of the information but i'm happy to find that information and share it with you um to answer your question thank you for that thank you mm -hmm. thank you Wano. um and we can certainly for any information we are happy to uh you know connect uh later on those specifics um, Patricia Warden, you want to go next? Thank you. I, I would like to thank uh, Neil Mongold for pointing out how important acquisition of existing properties have been in Arlington. We are very much afraid of 40B taking over our lives here. We have lost significant properties to those. Um, we, these are not 40 Ps that you can do any negotiation with. But in addition to that, um, I would like to say that as chair of the Housing Authority, we uh, did the renovation of the houses that Housing Corporation of Arlington bought um, at cost so as to encourage that mode of acquiring affordable housing for some years, we did that. Another thing I want to really thank Sean Hope for the wonderful job he did moving the historic property um, to the front at, at Massachusetts Avenue. I've been admiring it for a couple of years now, and I would like to, um, uh, to point out that we had hoped to do something similar, not quite as ambitious, in a house that, um, that we had uh, planned to add an addition at the back to a very handsome house, the Atwood House, on um, Massachusetts Avenue, but we got no support whatsoever from the town and the redevelopment board dropped the ball completely and allowed the-, the host I'm gonna also ask you, because we are over one minute, could you get thank to the you. question? Thank, thank you, and thank you, Sean Hope, for that wonderful work. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, Annie Lacord, do you wanna go next? Sure, thank you. So one of the things I'm noticing in all of the pro formas that you guys are showing is that you are receiving federal subsidy, state subsidy, and municipal subsidy. On any of these developments, had you been unable to receive money from the municipality, would you have been able to leverage the state and federal money anyways? Or are you entirely dependent on having at least some dollars from the local municipality to make these projects work? Well, Annie, the, um, typically the state does look for a local match, uh, a local contribution of, of some amount. And in, in the case of Arlington, um, I believe, and now this is again, don't quote me on this, but I believe that there was uh, CDBG money or some other source of money that helped us with the original purchasing of 
some of the, the properties. We also had a line of credit from, I believe it was TV Bank or uh, and or maybe Leader Bank uh, that assisted with the, the acquisition of these properties. We, unlike Cambridge, which is uh, amazing, absolutely amazing with its affordable housing trust fund um, that could put whatever it was, Sean said, $10 million into purchasing the properties there. Um, in Arlington, we, we, you know, we absolutely depended on the, the Community Preservation Act funds, but um, it, was, it was basically pulling together what resources we could uh, to make the acquisition. Once you have the acquisition, then you can, or at least a commitment to the acquisition, then you can start rolling the ball. We, one thing to note, we, uh, we applied to DHCD for funding in 2017, I, uh, 20, winter of 2016, 2017. And as frequently happens, we didn't get funded on the first time in. In fact, we didn't even get, we didn't get invited back the next, for the next round, but they had, luckily they had a mini round and we were finally um, granted the state, uh, both the state and, and the federal low income housing tax credits in 2019. So there's a talk about delays that someone I think uh, Jennifer had asked earlier. There's these kind of delays that are, are just typical of how long it takes to actually fund a project. And I know I'm going off, off the subject you asked about the local subsidy, but obviously for us in Arlington, we depend a lot on both the, the local subsidy uh, as well as um, private donations and, and the like. So. Thank you, Neil. And uh, we are running out of time. So uh, I'm going to, if, if the speakers are okay, I'm going to allow one more question. Um, okay, go ahead, Robin. Thank you all. Hi, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Um, I'm particularly interested in, and excited to see uh, that there are possibilities for projects that are 100% portable because people have told it's completely unfeasible and not possible. So I'm wondering if people would comment on that. And I also wanted to find out if you will make the, rec the recording of this available afterwards. Thanks. Yes, ACMI will be making a recording available afterwards. I'm not sure I heard the question. I think the question was that um, the speaker was encouraged to see 100% affordable projects. And could you speak to whether that's difficult to do or not? Um, is that correct, Robin? Is that close to what you were asking? I'm sorry, your, your audio is a little garbled. Um, I'm sorry. sorry. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. It's a little it's better. Close. Um, yes, I just wanted to know. Uh, we've always been told that 100% affordable isn't feasible, but I see that it is. So I was wondering if you have any about that and how to make that happen. And anybody want to chime in? I think make it happen. Um, so I think we've proved that it's feasible. Uh, it may or may not always be the right strategy for a particular spot, but um, it's certainly something that can happen. If yeah, I, I, I would agree with that, Karen. I think certainly, you know, I think we've all demonstrated and all have track records of showing that 100% affordable housing developments are feasible. Um, as you said, the question is, so what's appropriate for the particular neighborhood or community in which the housing is being being provided? Um, and I think that's sort of the, you know, the ultimate you know, question. And I, think it, I think we've also shown that there can be a mix of affordability, affordability from you know, down to 30% up to 100% and, and somewhere within that range um, can hopefully achieve the, the goals of the, of the community. Thanks, Bill. I know we have to wrap it up here, but we have a poll because we'd like to know what 
attendees would like to learn about in any future sessions or just what are the topics you're most interested in learning about in the housing space um, and we've got a bunch of them up here i'm going to let alex tell you what he wants you to do and if i can assert a moderator's privilege i'd like to give our panelists a lightning round question at the very end which is that you know we in arlington are looking to create more affordable housing what is the one most important thing that we have to do to get you to come here and develop affordable housing? Um, but a lightning round, so quick answers. So it's a multiple choice poll. Check everything you would like to hear about. My poll just went away. <clears throat> I don't mine, know mine also. I yeah, don't you're see right. It, it, it didn't. Yeah. Now let me relaunch it. Well, while you're doing that, I just want to express my gratitude to first the whole audience. You all are here when you could be doing something else, trying to learn about housing to make our community uh, a better, more inclusive community. So thank you so much for that. And to our panelists, we owe you a debt of gratitude for um, the time you spent preparing, sharing information about your projects, bringing your expertise and your willingness to talk with our community about how to create more affordability in our community. So I thank you so much. And uh, it's difficult to give you guys a hand in this uh, medium, but please consider yourselves applauded heartily. Thank you. It kind of looks like you guys want to hear, learn about all of this stuff, which is great. While we um, wrap that up, let's start our lightning round. I'm going to go in the reverse order that we went initially, just to throw you a loop for the loop. Um, and because I know Roger is seasoned and he can handle this as the first, uh, being the first one to answer this question. So Roger Brown, of preservation of affordable housing. What's the one thing a community needs to do to attract um, you to come and develop affordable housing? Uh, provide the opportunity for entitlement of site. Zoning. Permitting. Thank you. Permitting. Zoning and permitting. I'll figure um, out the money. <laughs> Uh, Amaryllis. Uh, I echo that, uh, but I, um, uh, like the community engagement around it, uh, you know, feeling that kind of sense of support, or at least that there could be discussion about what a community wants to see there and seeing that as an opportunity for partnership rather than necessarily adversarial relationships. Good answer. Bill Grogan. Uh, I would say flexibility. I mean, I think as we're trying to achieve some of these different objectives, again, sort of this push and pull about what can be, you know, whether it's reduced parking, whether it's expanded affordability, I think we really need flexibility to be able to, uh, you, know, you know, bring and be successful with, with some of these affordable and mixed income developments. Great answer. And I think Sean had to leave. Sean, if you're here, um, let me know, but because I don't want to skip you, but I think you had to leave because we're over. And so Neil, you get the last word. Well, thank you. You don't have to do anything to entice us to come to <laughs> Arlington because we're already here. <laughs> I'm the only one who can say that. And but appreciate uh, hearing from the other developers and uh, certainly it's been in our mind as the housing corporation, the potential for partnership with other organizations. You know, the, the, how, the uh, housing development plan that for the town envisions doing something like 80 units of affordable housing a year up to, up to maybe a hundred. Well, the housing corp has, we've in the 25 years that I've been on the board, we've done, we're coming up on 150 units total. <laughs> so we obviously don't have the capacity to do, you know, much larger scale. So I would say we would welcome, the Housing Corporation would welcome partnering with uh, other skilled developers that have a, a shared mission of affordable housing. Plus we just need to find the property and uh, have the continued support from the town of Arlington, so. Great, 
Um, last, I want to thank um, my co-organizers, the sponsoring organizations, um, as well as the individuals who uh, helped put this together. Alex Bagnell from Envision Arlington, Abby Corvea also from the Housing Corporation of Arlington, and uh, Jenny Ray and Kelly Linema, who are not here but are with our planning department. Um, and with that, I will thank you very much and send you off into your evenings. We will be sharing this, as Alex said, on ACMI, and we will take the results of this poll to be shared with all the sponsoring organizations who all are engaged in, in housing topics in many ways. So we'll, we'll all collectively try to figure out how to answer, uh, how to learn more about those topics. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for organizing. Stay Bye. safe.